Hello and welcome to Dove Biology Apes Lessons to Go. In this video we'll be exploring the risks, benefits, and sustainability of increasing food production in order to meet the demands of a growing population. Now while the green revolutions were certainly a way to increase food production, it isn't the final panacea. In fact, per capita grain production has actually begun to decrease. In this way, population growth is actually outstripping the volume of food that we produce. This is in part due to the fact that we've seen a diet shift to an increased consumption of meat as a result of industrialization. This is a much less efficient use of the land because the grain that's being produced is being fed to livestock instead of people. For example, uh, a cow requires 7 kilograms of grain per kilogram of body weight. That's a whole lot of grain to go for a single cow, and if you remember, because of the 10% uh, rule in the second law of thermodynamics, we're actually losing some of that uh, net uh, primary productivity that was captured in that uh, grain as it's been passed and then utilized by that cow. So um, our animals are a much less efficient use of those grain products. Um, of our animals, probably chicken and fish are more efficient, but they're still not as efficient as eating the grain directly ourselves. Now, without huge amounts of fertilizer and water, a lot of Green Revolution crop varieties are going to produce yields that are equal to or less than those from traditional strains. So it requires a high input of materials, and to maintain the production of fertilizer and the use of that water is truly unsustainable. The cost for the water, the fertilizer, and the pesticide is also way too high for most of our subsistence farmers. Another major issue facing food production is an increasing demand means that we're going to have an increased cost. Global demands for grains have increased as people want it for food and actually as a fuel source as we're using things like corn to produce ethanol. What this does with the increased demand is it actually increases the price for these commodities. Now for affluent and developed nations like the United States, we can actually afford this increase in food prices and for the most part have a surplus in food. As a result, we see a lot of food waste. In fact, about 70% of the food that we have actually gets lost as a result of spoiling, inefficient processing, preparation, and just plate waste as whatever we don't finish goes into the trash or, if at best, into a compost pile. Additionally, this uh, abundance of food has actually led to overnutrition and obesity, which has its own significant health considerations. Now, unfortunately, developing countries are unable to keep pace with the growing prices of grains. And so, therefore, one in six people in developing countries are undernourished or malnourished. To be undernourished means that you're actually not getting the appropriate calories that you need to sustain your life each day. This is a biological uh, concept called marasmus. Now, if you have malnutrition, you're getting plenty of calories. You've got probably rice or potatoes as a staple. But unfortunately, you're not getting other key nutrients or proteins in your diet, resulting in kwashiorkor. So currently, we have basically a threefold challenge. One, we need to match the changing demand for food from a larger and more affluent population to its supply. We need to do so in a way that is environmentally sustainable, and we need to ensure that the world's poorest people are no longer hungry. So this challenge will require changes in the way that food is produced, stored, processed, distributed, and accessed. It requires changes that are as radical as those that occurred during the Green Revolution. So, could we simply irrigate more croplands to be able to grow food? Well, unfortunately, due to population growth, we've seen significant aquifer depletion. Inefficient use of irrigated water can, use to, uh, can lead to salt buildup in the soil or uh, water logging. And then once again, to have a really quality irrigation system, it can be quite expensive. And this might price out a lot of uh, subsistence farmers that live in developing countries. Could we then cultivate more land, convert like wilderness into cropland? Sounds like a pretty good idea on the surface because if we actually cleared all the tropical forests and then started irrigating arid lands, we could actually double the world's cropland. But the land in these areas have very poor soil. 
they oftentimes have steep slopes, so it's very expensive to cultivate these marginal lands. And if we're cutting down the tropical forests and modifying arid environments, we're actually causing habitat destruction and degradation, which is going to reduce our overall world's biodiversity. So we have to get a little bit more radical than these uh, early solutions. So one interesting approach could be to apply new agricultural techniques like hydroponics and aquaponics. Here, it, we actually use less water and it requires less fertilization as the plants are grown in minimal soil and they're able to then uh, be uh, grown actually indoors. So we're using much less land. Uh, we're also mimicking natural processes. If in aqua, aquaponics, uh, we have fish that are growing alongside um, our plant material. Uh, the fish wastes, the nitrogen and the phosphorus that's produced there, actually can be then used as fertilizer. The ground can actually filter the water for the fish. And so side by side, we're producing uh, two potential staples. Unfortunately, it's not as easy as it looks because this requires specialized training and specialized equipment and not all farmers are equipped to be able to do that at this time. One way, perhaps then, that we could increase the amount of agricultural space is using urban areas. Right now we have 800 million urban gardens that provide 15% of the world's food. And it's estimated that 50% of the total area in many cities and developing countries that are actually vacant public land that we could use to produce food. We can grow food um, on roofs or in uh, empty lots. And this way, um, we're providing food that's closer uh, to people, uh, reduces the amount of fossil fuels and things that we need to transport that food. It's right there in the environment, which is connecting the people to their food. Um, and so urban gardens is a, a pretty good solution for increasing food and food availability. Another way to increase the amount of food that we have is to actually try to move down the food chain. Now, meat and meat products are a great source of protein, but it takes a large input of grain, water, and fossil fuels to maintain our, um, our animals. You get a lot of water pollution from waste lagoons, especially in concentrated animal feeding operations. Animals produce a lot of greenhouse gases, and so they actually contribute to the concept of climate change and global warming. And when we are using these industrialized farming techniques, the dense populations of these animals make them more vulnerable to disease. So if we uh, eat less of these animals, we would need um, to be able to maintain these large operations and the grain that is being prepared to feed these animals can then be used for human consumption. And so that's actually going to increase the amount of food available for people. Another idea is to increase our aquaculture. Recall when we were back talking about um, the harvest that we get from the ocean and that in many cases we're overfishing. So we can perhaps supplement that uh, by doing aqu aquaculture, uh, growing and harvesting fish and shellfish um, in ponds and irrigation dishes, ditches um, along coastal lagoons and estuaries. Now, this could be advantageous because we can get a lot of yield of organisms, a lot of food in a small volume. Aquaculture uses a lot less fossil fuels than other um, animal operations. And for farmers, we actually have an opportunity to make quite a deal of profit from these operations. Unfortunately, this isn't a perfect solution because there are several disadvantages as well. Um, there's a large input of land, feed, and water that goes into um, aquaculture. Because we've got lots of fish in a small area, there's going to be a lot of waste. And so it can actually kind of pollute the nearby areas and it actually limits the lifespan of those um, aquaculture pens to about 10 years. Um, in a lot of aquaculture endeavors, they actually um, are done in old mangrove forests that have been uh, damaged or destroyed to produce the large lagoons to be able to raise um, these fish and shellfish. And once again, because we're growing um, organisms in close proximity when high density, they're much more vulnerable to disease. Another solution, and this is very avant-garde, is using new foods. 
we only have four major um, grain species that we use for food and you know probably you know four or five different animal species that are our primary uh, food items there's lots of plants and animals um, that have high nutrient value that are much more sustainable but we're not using them for food um, one such example is things like micro livestock and, and eating insects um, insects are rich in protein and they're very efficient in their use of uh, the primary productivity that happens from the producers. Um, there's also exotic plant species like the winged bean here. The problem is, is would people eat them? You know, we already eat a small amount of insects that are ground up, you know, kind of by accident in the food that we eat. But if it was actually our primary food item, you know, would we eat them? You know, what would it take to change kind of the culture or the view of eating these kind of new food items? Finally, a lot of people feel that science is the answer for our food woes. Um, through the use of genetic engineering, uh, we can further allow for crops to grow in more arid environments, um, to be more insect resistant, um, or perhaps even produce greater volume. Like um, the sumo salmon here has uh, genes from several different salmon species and an eel species, which allows them to grow much larger um, in a smaller amount of time than traditional salmon. So what are the negatives? Well, unfortunately, we lose genetic diversity, especially if the genes uh, that are now in these engineered crops or animals uh, are then put into the wild. Um, our native genetic diversity gets diluted. Um, the, the native or natural plant and animal materials, the genes there have been developed for thousands of years as a result of natural selection. Um, it's kind of set up for just in case in the future, if there's some kind of disease or disaster, that there's some resilience in that population. And perhaps with modified genes, we eliminate that resilience and make us vulnerable to issues that might crop up in the future. Additionally, the technology is still quite expensive to go from kind of prototype to full-on uh, production. And so this, once again, would probably be something only available to those developed countries. So there's no obvious solution. Um, in order for us to uh, try to reduce hunger and malnutrition and the harmful effects of agriculture, we have to have a multifaceted approach. Firstly, slowing population growth is something that actually will help any environmental problem especially things dealing with hunger and malnutrition. If there are fewer mouths to feed, then there'll be less of a need for increasing food production. If we develop and phase in low input agriculture, it minimizes the amount of fossil fuels and resources that we need to grow our food. Shifting to organic farming also might have a way for us to be much more sustainable with that environment. If we change our diets and become a little more vegetarian, even like once a week, it's going to reduce the impact that we have in terms of our ecological footprint and make more grains available for more people. And then finally, we need to reduce our waste. All along uh, the, pro the process of producing food from our beginning to the end, if we have less waste all along, there's going to be more food for more people down the line.